Life on Earth is in a state of dynamic balance. Plants and animals constantly interact and profoundly affect each other's fates. From their beginnings, organisms have evolved intricate relationships and have developed numerous strategies for survival. To understand the subtle forces affecting the balances in life, scientists are combining studies of animals and plants in the laboratory with investigations in natural environments. A central actor in this unfolding story of behavioral ecology is the monarch butterfly. are known as milkweed butterflies. They seek out and lay their eggs only on milkweeds, and the monarch caterpillars feed only on these plants. Dr. Lincoln Brower of Amherst College demonstrates this food plant specificity. Twenty-five larvae are placed on a tomato plant, and another twenty-five are put onto a milkweed. Within hours, the larvae consume the milkweed, but are unable to eat the tomato plant and would eventually starve. Indeed, milkweeds are the only plants that monarch larvae will eat. After hatching, the caterpillar, in two weeks, multiplies its birth weight 3,000 times. It accomplishes this feat by eating more than 16,000 times its own birth weight in milkweed leaves. The monarch has many relatives, all of which feed on milkweed. These butterflies are limited to the tropics, but the monarch, well deserving of its name, has broken away from its tropical origins by evolving a unique migratory behavior which allows it to invade North America and take advantage of more than 100 different species of milkweed. The fact that monarchs will eat nothing but milkweed is even more remarkable because many milkweeds are poisonous. They contain drugs called cardiac glycosides, similar to the familiar drug digitalis used in the treatment of human heart disease.
People throughout the ages have taken it for granted that certain plants contain drugs useful to man. But why did plants evolve poisonous drugs? Naturalists reasoned that these poisons protect the plants from being eaten. The fact that grazing animals avoid milkweed in otherwise completely dry fields supports this hypothesis. But no defense system ever attains perfection. The milkweed's chemical defense is ineffective against some insect grazers. Katydids and grasshoppers can devastate the milkweeds. And as monarchs do, they do so with no evidence of ill effects. In fact, they seem to thrive. The milkweed this monarch will consume before becoming a chrysalid contains enough poison to kill five people. What becomes of these milkweed poisons the monarch eats? Naturalists found their first clue while observing the wings of captured specimens. Some wings were found to bear beak marks, clear evidence of attack by birds. Could it be that birds rejected these butterflies because they contained poisonous drugs? To find out, Dr. Brower offered monarch butterflies to blue jays in laboratory experiments. Within minutes, the jay's behavior begins to change. The jay reacts violently. Vomiting gets rid of the poison. If the jay did not vomit, the cardiac glycosides could cause heart failure in the bird. The jay's reaction proves that the milkweed poisons absorbed by the monarch caterpillar are still present in the adult butterfly. Over half an hour or so, the jay recovers completely from being poisoned by the monarch. When offered a second monarch, another experienced bird rejects it on sight. The jay has learned that the bright orange and black color pattern signifies poisonous food. Butterflies with different color patterns that the jays have learned are palatable are discriminated and eaten. Thus, monarchs are ecological chemists. By ingesting the poisons of the milkweed leaves, they're able to take over the plant's chemical defense system for their own protection. To explore this phenomenon of ecological chemistry in more depth, monarchs were raised on a variety of milkweeds. The tropical American Asclepius curasavica produced monarchs with enough poison to make four blue jays vomit. A Florida milkweed, Asclepius humistrata, produced monarchs with sufficient poison to cause eight jays to vomit. Unexpectedly, the South American Gonolobus rostratus produced monarchs which were completely palatable to the jays. 
Thus it was discovered that there can be a poison spectrum in the monarch butterfly, which depends upon the species of milkweed eaten by the caterpillars. But laboratory findings don't necessarily reflect what actually happens in nature. Therefore, the researchers decided to learn more about milkweeds and monarchs in their natural environment. Because of their tropical ancestry, monarchs have no way to avoid freezing, and as fall approaches, they leave the north. By placing tags on the wings, much has been learned about their migration. During the daytime, the butterflies fly in a generally southward direction. In the east, they pause frequently for nectar, provided by an abundance of fall flowers. Toward late afternoon, they cluster together in trees to spend the night. The next day, they resume their long journey southward. By late November, numerous eastern monarchs arrive in southern Florida. Some remain and chance the winter frosts, but most continue migrating into Mexico where hundreds of thousands from eastern and central North America overwinter in remote valleys. Monarchs in the far west move across the dry inland areas toward the Pacific coast of California. Here they spend the winter in isolated groves of pine or eucalyptus trees, far enough back from the sea to avoid winter gales, yet close enough to protect them from heavy winter frosts. As fall progresses, many thousands gather to festoon the trees. In these sanctuaries, the monarchs cluster together for protection during the winter. On sunny winter days, many monarchs warm sufficiently to leave their cluster. They fly lazily about the grove and open their wings to absorb the heat from the sun. drops toward late afternoon, the monarchs reform their cluster. It is believed that an assembling chemical, or pheromone, released into the air by the roosting butterflies attracts others to them. With the coming of the winter rains, the clusters become dense. The monarchs, virtually immobilized, cling to the leaves, branches, and to each other. They may go for days without changing their position in the trees. Many monarchs that survive the migration do not find safety in the overwintering groves. Winter storms may kill hundreds or even thousands. The struggle to survive until spring is intense. If they're blown out of the trees or are disturbed in fall, they shiver instinctively and strive to get into sunny spots for further warming. If the critical body temperature is not reached, they cannot fly back to the cluster, and they're subject to death through exposure or predation.
Predation was found to occur in the clusters themselves. During the night, maimed monarchs fell to the ground, victims of unknown predators. The milkweed poisons did not give the monarchs as much protection as Dr. Brower had assumed. Mice or other small mammals feed upon the monarchs too. Caches of dismembered wings were found beneath logs, next to tree trunks and under sticks. The remains of 44 butterflies were found in one cache alone. In spite of the presumed poison protection, it became obvious that the monarch butterfly was prey for a variety of predators. But the vulnerable overwintering period eventually passes. The dangers of winter are left behind as the lengthening days gradually usher in the rites of the California springtime. Clusters reform at different heights in the trees and in different parts of the grove. This shifting about may help to foil nocturnal predators because no longer is the position of any one cluster predictable from night to night. By mid-February, the increasing day length stimulates sexual activity and the monarchs become involved in their intricate mating ceremony. Males patrol for females and pursue them in frenzied courting flights. The male disseminates a seducing chemical and captures the female in midair. Then they float to the ground in an aerial embrace. The female must be flipped over before coupling can occur. joined, the male summons the additional strength to carry them safely away. They must remain together for several hours for insemination to take place and the mating to be fertile. The monarchs that survived the predators and storms of the overwintering age rapidly in the warmer weather. Because of their great expenditure of energy in courting, the males deteriorate. 
Many die while others disperse at random. The females, however, after mating one or more times, leave the colonies and follow the advancing spring up the lush California coastal valleys. This dispersal is a critical period in the annual cycle of the monarch. Before they die, the females must efficiently seek out many milkweeds on which to lay hundreds of eggs. One of the first milkweeds they encounter is Asclepius cordifolia. By depositing their eggs on this and other spring species, the monarchs establish a new generation. The females that survive have accomplished that task. The cycle begins again and the monarchs multiply. As the oncoming summer dries up the other vegetation, many species of milkweeds thrive and provide a diverse menu for the dispersing monarchs. Leaving the coastal mountains, the fresh generation follows the moist river courses up into the Sierra Nevadas. Monarch finds Asclepius fasicularis, an ideal milkweed upon which to lay the eggs of yet another generation. Once over the mountains, the monarchs continue to disperse, seeking milkweeds wherever they grow. The annual migration cycle of the monarch butterfly involves several generations. As summer ends, the fall generation of monarchs migrates toward the isolated overwintering sanctuaries, principally in central Mexico and along the Pacific coast of California. Here they spend the entire winter. In the spring, the surviving fall generation mates and disperses. The females seek out milkweeds, lay their eggs, and die. The first spring generation develops and continues to disperse the species. This process repeats itself through a series of about four breeding cycles until the North American continent is entirely repopulated. But as fall approaches, the shortening day length triggers another series of hormonal changes. All sexual behavior is quelled egg production ceases, and food energy is stored as fat to fuel the long journey ahead and sustain them through the winter. Now the butterflies, just as their great-great-grandparents did the previous fall, begin congregating to perform the arduous migration back to the overwintering grounds that they have never seen. The study of the annual cycle, culminating in the extensive spring dispersal, confirmed that monarchs locate and breed on scores of North American milkweed species. The researchers' prediction that a poison spectrum occurs in natural populations of the monarch now seems certain to be correct. To make the definitive test, monarchs and milkweeds were gathered from locations in California and during the fall migration in Massachusetts. Back in the laboratory, the samples were prepared for chemical analysis. Cardiac glycosides react with certain chemicals to produce a blue color, which is measured in a spectrophotometer. The more poison there is, the deeper the blue. The clear sample indicates the absence of cardiac glycosides. A graph displays the precise quantities of poison. The more poison there is in a sample, the more the pen is deflected downward. The butterflies ranged widely, 
in their cardiac glycoside content. Measurements of the Massachusetts monarchs showed a continuous range of variation in poison levels. A poison spectrum was also determined for the California sample. Half of the monarchs from the California collection contained no poison at all. And the second line is the gonalobe. Why should an insect which has evolved into such an efficient ecological chemist eat milkweeds which lack cardiac glycosides? Another experiment with blue jays provided an answer. This bird was previously fed a poisonous monarch. It is now offered both a poisonous and a non-poisonous monarch. Because the two butterflies look exactly alike, the bird can't tell them apart and rejects both on sight. In other words, the non-poisonous monarch is a perfect mimic or auto-mimic of the poisonous one. In this way, the poisonous portion of the population can protect the non-poisonous portion. But even this sophisticated strategy for survival is not perfect. The nagging question remained, why do birds attack so many monarchs in the California overwintering colonies? In search for an answer, the researchers again turned to the blue jay and more carefully observed its behavior. An experienced jay may forget its previous emetic reaction or be hungry enough to attack another monarch on the chance that it might be palatable. By pecking the monarch, the jay can taste the bitter flavor of the cardiac glycoside. The bird then rejects the poisonous monarch. The jay, however, will peck and then eat the auto-mimic. The bird can break through the visual deception of auto-mimicry using its ability to taste discriminate. Learning then becomes a leading edge in the evolutionary process. Because the birds can penetrate the monarch's chemical defense by taste discrimination, the monarch is put under pressure to further refine its mode of protection. How it adjusts to this pressure over time could in turn influence the evolution of the milkweed. Indeed, all life is in a state of dynamic balance. Plants and animals constantly interact and profoundly affect each other's fates. From their beginnings, organisms have evolved intricate relationships and have developed numerous strategies for survival.